Good morning, Westmont. Uh, I have the honor and uh, the privilege of introducing a dear friend, Kate Wallace Nunley. Uh, she's the co-founder of the Junea Project, a ministry that advocates for women leaders in the church. She's an associate pastor of Wellspring Free Methodist Church in Bakersfield, Bakersfield, where she lives with her husband, Leaf, and their fur baby, Boo. Little random fact about Leaf is Leaf used to be the Clark RD back in the day. So he's a Clarkster. Um, but we're not going to talk about Leaf, we're talking about Kate. Uh, Kate holds a bachelor's degree from APU, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and is currently pursuing her MDiv at Azusa Pacific Seminary. Our hope and our joy is in the opportunity to dialogue. Um, we recognize that for some in our community, they may think or believe differently, but we hope that the words and the sermon that Kate offers will just bring a vibrant conversation on this campus, one where we get to hear and learn from one another as we have conversations about women uh, in leadership in the church. So with absolute honor uh, and joy, I get to introduce Kate. And with that, uh, if you want to hear more from Kate, uh, the fe women, blah, 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 Westmont Feminist Society um, will be hosting a lunch Q&A right after in Founders so that you can hear a little bit more or offer direct questions to Kate after her sermon today. So Kate, come on to stage and share a good word with us. Thanks. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you all here at Westmont College. Uh, as Shannon said, uh, my husband Leif used to be an RD here, so when we first started dating, I would come up here on weekends. So Westmont has a dear place in my heart because of that. Um, I want to say a quick thank you to Shannon and also to the Feminist Society here at Westmont and Pastor Ben also for inviting me here this morning. It's an honor to be speaking with all of you. Um, well, I was invited here this morning to talk ab about women in the church because I run a ministry with my mom called the Junia Project, and it exists to advocate for women being leaders in the church and for mutuality in marriage. And over the last few years, it's been around about five years, uh, God has taken us on kind of a crazy journey and allowed us to speak with churches and pastors and colleges and students to broaden the conversation about men and women and how they relate to one another in the church and Christian community. And we believe at the Junia Project that this is one of the most important topics of our day not only because our culture has confusing messages about what it means to be a man or a woman, not only because our culture over-sexualizes every relationship between a man and a woman, but also because today, in 2018, we find ourselves in the middle of a three-decade-long debate on the role and place of women in the evangelical church. And on one side, you have what's called complementarian theology, which teaches that men and women are created to be equal but are intended by God to have different roles and responsibilities. And these roles and responsibilities mean that women will never hold positions of authority over men in the church or in the home. And it requires the unilateral submission of women to men in the family and in the Christian community. Complementarians use terms like biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. And they believe that men are given a special authority over women in the church and home and Christian community. And on the other side of this debate, you have egalitarian theology, which teaches that God created men and women to be equal, and that roles and responsibilities aren't given to them based on their gender. Gender neither privileges nor hurts a believer's call to ministry. Men and women minister together in the church and practice mutual submission in marriage. Egalitarians don't believe that the Bible teaches one definition of manhood or one definition of womanhood, but that the Bible tells lots of different stories of different men and women who are gifted and called by God to do different things. And this debate might be familiar to some of us, but if we're honest, it's a little bit confusing or scary to enter into because we have pastors and mentors that fall on one side of the debate or the other. We come from families and churches that fall on one side of the debate or the other. We have friends and boyfriends or girlfriends that fall on one side of the debate or the other. 
And we hear evangelical leaders saying things about this conversation like slippery slope, or low view of scripture, or feminism. And that's scary, because that means if we enter into this debate and try to figure out what we think for ourselves, we too could be labeled with those terms. Now I know that this is kind of a scary topic, but for those of us in the church, whether we've figured out what we believe on this or not yet, this debate has already had profound implications on our theology, our view of God, on our relationships with other people, and on our view of ourselves. It is very likely that this topic will influence the kind of jobs you choose to enter into, the kind of marriages that you enter into, and the kind of things that you think God will or will not call you to in your lifetime. Now, I know that this conversation is intimidating, but I have good news for us. This is not the first time in church history that Christians have disagreed on this topic. This goes back, well, to the second century of the church, but in recent times to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, when all of those different Protestant groups broke off of the Catholic Church. And from those groups came things like Wesleyan holiness theology, and Reformed theology, and Lutheran theology. And those different groups and ways of thinking have morphed and formed and influenced many of the denominations we have today. And although those denominations are Orthodox Christian denominations, they all believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, lived, dies, and rose again to defeat death and save us from sin, they differ on some theological issues. We all know this, like predestination, or infant baptism, or communion practices, and yes, also on the role and place of women. So what this conversation actually is between these two different groups is a difference of opinion on how God chooses to work in and through God's people. It's a clashing of long-held theologies. There's no need to be afraid of entering into this conversation to figure out what you think for yourself because so many Christians before you have walked that path. And God will meet you there as you do that. This is not a secular conversation. This is a thoroughly Christian conversation. And I, too, have heard those comments that this is really just culture versus the church or it's feminism infiltrating the church. But history teaches us that 250 years before the start of feminism in the Western world, Christian women were preaching and teaching and traveling as evangelists. And other Christians were teaching that they shouldn't. This is a long history of the Christian church. There's no need to be afraid. And I too have waded through this stuff before, not knowing what I believed. And my story is probably different from yours. But this morning I feel that God is asking me to tell you some of that story. My own story began in eighth grade when I began attending a private Christian school for the first time. And that school was adamant about teaching their particular view of the role and place of women. So I sat in Bible class as I was taught things like, because Adam was created first, he had authority over Eve, and therefore all men have authority over all women. They taught me that because Eve was described as helper in Genesis, that all women are merely meant to help men in their calling for God. They taught me that because a woman was the first to sin, all women are easily deceived and therefore require the leadership of men. I was taught that God only gives gifts of leadership to men and God only calls men to lead in the church. I was taught that Paul didn't want any woman in any church in any time to lead and that he said so in 1 Timothy 2.12. I was taught that 1 Timothy 3 only used male pronouns when describing elders so only men could be elders. And I was told that anyone who taught me anything different from this was influenced by culture and had a low view of scripture. Now this was not a topic my childhood church talked much about. And I was in eighth grade, so I did what any eighth grader would do. I ran home and asked my parents, what do we believe on this? I don't know what to believe, tell me. But my parents are academics. So instead of telling me what to believe, they gave me three stacks of books <laughs> on complementarian theology and patriarchal theology and egalitarian theology. 
I was in eighth grade. Um, <laughs> so I jumped in the deep end and waded through that stuff from eighth grade through college, just reading and studying and looking through the word and praying and begging anyone who would talk to me to talk to me about this. Because more than anything in the world, I wanted to honor God with my life. But as a woman, I didn't know what to do until I knew what God wanted from me on this. So I dove in and I quickly learned that this debate is not one between people who have a high view of scripture and people who have a low view. This is not one between people who are influenced by culture and people who somehow magically are not. I learned that this debate is between people who love God and are trying to put this Bible into practice, to put God's teaching into practice well. I also learned that egalitarians teach things very differently than my school was teaching me. I learned that egalitarians uh, pointed out that the order of creation must not mean authority because animals are created before humans, but animals don't have authority over humans. Logical. They taught that the Hebrew word translated as helper to describe Eve is really azer konegdo, which means a rescuing strength equal and opposite to Adam. They taught that Eve's sin has no more to say about all womankind than Judas's betrayal has to say about all mankind. They pointed out that in scripture the gifts of the spirit are not given to believers based on their gender. They taught that while Paul seemed to be limiting the role of some women in 1 Timothy, he seems to expect the leadership and teaching of other women because he thanks them for it in Romans and Corinthians. And they taught that while our English translations for the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3 have male pronouns, the original Greek does not. And they talked about all these women leaders in the New Testament church, like Phoebe the deacon and Junia the apostle, and Priscilla the great teacher who taught and corrected a man, and the daughters of Philip who prophesied all these women who my Bible teachers just must have forgotten to tell me about. And for a while, I lived in this tension between what my school seemed to be teaching me and what I was seeing in the church at large and what God seemed to be teaching me in my own study. And I think that was really good for me because I had to honestly grapple with what I believed, not what my church believed, not what my parents believed, but what was God calling me to? And if I'm honest... Both sides had good scriptural support for their beliefs. But do you know what it came down to for me? The biggest influence on me in the debate was how Jesus interacted with women in the Gospels. I had to really weigh the things that I was seeing in churches versus what I saw in the life of Jesus. Jesus, who told a woman to preach the good news of his resurrection, yet some in the church won't let a woman preach that same message from the pulpit. Jesus, who discipled women in Luke chapter 10, but many teach that this is somehow overly dangerous for male pastors to do. Jesus depended on the financial provision of women for the welfare of his ministry in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 8, but many in the church teach that men are to be the sole providers in Christian communities. Jesus used female examples in his teachings and spoke about women in his stories, Luke 15 and 13. But one popular preacher is saying that Christianity is supposed to have a masculine feel. A young woman carried the body and blood of Jesus within her for nine months. Yet some in the church won't let a woman serve communion in service. Jesus denied that there was hierarchy in his kingdom in Matthew 20 but some teach that there is a hierarchy between men and women. Isn't the difference striking? There really are a lot of things being said today in the church about women that just don't add up when faced with the life of Jesus. And through my studies, I came to believe that both men and women are called to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. I came to believe that the culture of the church that teaches men have authority over women misses the point of a God that says to be first, you must be last. And if you want to be a leader, you've got to be a servant. I came to believe that instead of being concerned about wielding authority over one another, we should be concerned about loving one another. 
I came to believe that instead of creating a hierarchy amongst God's people based on race or gender or socioeconomic class, that we should recognize the words of Galatians 3.28, that in Christ there is Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for we are all one. In other words, I came to believe that the difference between the church practice and the life of Jesus matters. That our words and our beliefs, that they matter. Because women, you and I have grown up in a church culture where our worth and dignity are openly debated because they aren't a given. But women, your worth and dignity are not determined by how well you fit into someone's definition of biblical womanhood. They are not determined by getting married or having babies or learning to be submissive. And men, the same thing goes for you. Your worth and dignity are not determined by how well you fit into biblical manhood. They're not determined by the job you have, by the kind of money you make, and certainly not by your ability to exert authority over other people. Men and women, your worth and dignity were determined the moment you were created in the image of the living God. And your place in the kingdom are determined the moment your sins were nailed to the cross of the risen Christ. Men and women, your worth and dignity are not things to be debated because they are not things that can be lost or stolen or even earned. They simply are. And it is important that you know that. It is important because this world is in desperate need for all of God's people, men and women, to follow their call, to stand up to the injustices of this world and to lead the church in the way that we should go. Because if you look around, The majority of humanitarian crises are happening to women. According to the UN, the World Health Organization, and US government sources, 70% of those living in poverty today are women. 100 to 200 million girls are missing from today's generation due to preference of sons over daughters, gender-based violence, and the killing of baby girls and fetuses. Rape is a primary weapon of war, especially in some African countries. 48 women are estimated to be raped every hour in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. One third of the world's girls are married before the age of 18, and one in nine are married before the age of 15. That's child marriages to adult men. More than 125 million girls and women alive today have undergone female genital mutilation. Sex trafficking is thought to be the second largest criminal industry in the world, and more than 80% of of the victims are female. In the US, one in five women report being raped. Seven in 10 assaults against women are perpetrated by an intimate partner. That's a husband or an ex-husband, a boyfriend or an ex-boyfriend. Women are in desperate need to hear the message that they too are created in the image of God, that they too were created to have dominion over this earth, and that they too can use their gifts and their callings to lead in the church. And I know some of you women in here today have thought about this before. Maybe you felt that leading of God or heard that still small voice and said, is God calling me into leadership in the church? And just as Jesus told Mary Magdalene to preach the good news of the resurrection, Jesus is calling many of you women in here today to do the same. So go and do. Preach the gospel. Pastor God's people. Lead with wisdom and a sound mind. Do it because you've been gifted to do it. Do it because God is calling you to do it. Do it because the church and the world need you to do it. And oh, how we need you to do that. And women, when you go and do, if they tell you that you need a man's covering to do so, You tell them that Jesus Christ died for you as much as anyone else, and his blood is the only covering you need. And if they tell you that your husband should be your spiritual head and should be making the decisions and having the final say, you say that the day you became a Christian, Jesus became your spiritual head, and Jesus makes your decisions, and Jesus has the final say. And if they tell you that women are weak, You tell them that you come from a long line of godly women who led the army of Israel to victory, who saved God's people from genocide, and who birthed the savior of the world. 
And if they tell you that you're just trying to be like a man, you say, yes, I am. I'm trying to be like that poor Jewish carpenter turned preacher who turned away from the conventional in order to preach the unconventional. I'm trying to be like that man who surrounded himself with men and women and rich and poor and educated and uneducated and who died for them all. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm going to end with a poem that I wrote a while back. It is addressed to God and it illustrates part of my journey and I hope that it brings encouragement to some of you. It's called, They Gave Me a Box. I grew up learning about you. I saw you in the love shared by everyone around me. I heard about you in the sermons and sang about you in the songs. I read about you and thought about you. And so I came to you and you met me. You loved and cared for me. You grew and taught me. You fashioned me and called me. And I took what you had given me and I went back to the place I had first heard about you. I was filled with anticipation. What would they have me do? You had given me so many gifts. Perhaps I could speak about you. Perhaps I could teach others about you. Perhaps I could spread your message to the world. Perhaps I could invite others to your table to partake in your supper. For they had always prayed for people of my generation to raise up and be leaders in the church. They had always said how desperately your kingdom needed more voices, more hands, and more feet. So with anticipation, I presented myself to them only to be confused with their response. For when I offered them this voice you had given me, when I offered them these hands that you had strengthened and these feet that you had guided, they gave me a box. They gave me a box in which to keep my passion. They gave me a box in which to keep my wisdom. They gave me a box in which to put my words and a box to put my hands and my feet. They gave me a box and they told me that it was your will for me as a woman. When I asked if they had a box that fit a bit better, they told me that I should be happy with what you had given me. When I told them you had given me things that wouldn't fit inside the box, they told me I must be mistaken. When I asked if there was anything else they could offer, they told me that the box was a perfect place to keep my questions. And so I come to you, me and everything you have given me, me and everything you have called me to, me and everything you've created me to be, and the box. I'm a bit bruised from trying to fit inside of it. And now that I'm standing in front of you, I realize that you don't want me to. I see that I have a choice. I can keep the box they have given me and throw out all the things that don't fit. I can ignore the time I spent with you, the gifts you've given me, the calling you gave me. I can dismember my soul in order to fit into the dimensions of the box. I can live for them and let their box define me. Or I can trust the way you made me, the way you prepared me, the way you called me. I can learn, lean on you for guidance and walk in the footsteps of brave women who've gone before. I can live fully alive in you and trust that you are a God who's bigger than the box. I can set the box down and walk away. I can live for you and let you define me. They gave me a box and called it yours. You offer me freedom and call it mine. So I take the box and I put it on a shelf and I label it history. Then I take your hand and we walk away because life with you is better than life in a box. Let's pray together. Gracious and living God, we thank you that when we were still far off, you met us in Christ Jesus and brought us home. God, I pray that your spirit stirs in the hearts of students here today and that anyone who is feeling a call to ministry, man or woman, feels your leading and encouragement to follow that call. God, I pray for all the questions that might come up 
And I pray for your leading and your guidance because we know that you meet us there in our questions. God, I pray for the student body that you would walk with them in the rest of their semester and that you would teach them about any box that someone has given you that is not yours. Teach us to let the box go and follow instead what your freedom brings. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. You're dismissed.